Okay, so I think we've come to that time uh, where we want to start our webinars. So uh, uh, we'll let people roll in as they need to uh, for the next uh, few minutes. So, uh, yep, so welcome to InterTrust webinar. Uh, what are serious? Uh, today, the topic is going to be buy versus build. Uh, it's put together by uh, by us here internally. It, our speaker today is going to be Julian Durant, who is uh, our VP of Product Management and our CISO. Um, and my name is Heverly Ahadland. I'm the uh, director of uh, product marketing for our platform uh, platform services. And um, I wanted to give you perhaps a quick introduction before we get started with the actual webinar. Uh, I think the key things that uh, you will learn from today's uh, talk would be first, uh, focus on your business and product, uh, not on tangential issues regarding security, authentication, um, and, and trust. Uh, we are the experts at that. I think we can offer a robust uh, number of solutions so that you focus on what you do best and we can focus on what we, how we can help you achieve your goals. We also, I think uh, you'll take away some information regarding mitigating risk, uh, consult with experts uh, like us and because we can guide that journey for you. And finally, uh, if you have an expert ally with you, uh, you can shorten your time to market by getting appropriate guidance. So uh, uh, those are, I think, the main three things that we'll learn today. And uh, without much further ado, uh, Julian, take it away. Terrific. Thank you so much, Heb. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you to all of you for taking the time today to go through what I really consider to be one of the most important elements underpinning the Internet of Things, and that's the security of the systems, the endpoints, the devices, uh, the things that make up this incredible capability that's grown over the last several years. I think we all know that the number of IoT devices are growing explosively at a CAGR of 18%. There's already 14.4 billion uh, deployed today, uh, uh, according to IoT analytics. It's an incredible number of endpoints. It's performed wonders in terms of automating our society and providing really great outcomes for us to more efficiently run manufacturing and smart grids and many, many other things. The trouble is, though that they have also been found by the hacking community and the hacking community finds a lot of utility in taking over all these things. And the early deployments of these machines and devices has been, uh, has been a little bit weak in the way the security has actually been implemented. Here's the top five gotchas, if you will. Uh, the first message really is that IoT devices make up roughly a third of infected devices today. And, and the growth rate is incredible because it was only 16% in 2019. What are you at risk at? Why do you need to secure de your devices? Number one is insecure protocols. A lot of the field area networks, especially a lot of the meshes, have insecure protocols, either not up to date or the protocols themselves aren't really well designed. That leads to problems like man-in-the-middle attacks. Man-in-the-middle attacks can have really significant implications because that man in the middle, that hacker in the middle can intercept traffic, change traffic, completely change your vision or visuals of your operation and do things like, as I'll talk a little bit later on about botnets, stay resident, become real advanced persistent threats as they take over many, many gateways and use those gateways to attack even more devices. So by one measure, 98% of IoT device traffic is, is insecure or insufficiently secured. Device hijacking, that's a big, big target of, of the botnets because as, as everyone probably knows, right, the botnets are are used to do many nefar nefarious attacks. They're botnet armies. The, uh, the uh, Mirai botnet today has hundreds of thousands of devices that are at the command and control of the manager of the botnet, and they can do really significant damage in terms of distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, they could be used for brute force attacks. They could do all sorts of really nefarious, difficult things to defend against. When you come in at that volume, that number of devices, devices, uh, it it's really puts your system at, at risk. 
A lot of times there's weak encryption, insufficient key lengths, insufficient key types. Sometimes encryption is well used, but the encryption keys are left vulnerable on the devices, not properly protected. And of course, malware is just ripping through all these insecurities and making the whole IoT insecure. Here's some actual real world examples of, of the kind of things that happen. They're only illustrative. Uh, there are many, many, many more examples than this specifically, but I thought it'd be interesting to look at four different IoT segments and look at how vulnerabilities can cause, can cause real problems. So the target attack from about eight years ago, target uh, was breached more than 40 million uh, personally identifiable information records were breached, including credit cards and addresses and things like that. What many people don't realize is that the way the hackers got into Target wasn't through their IT system, it was through their OT system, their operational technology system, their heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. And they used that to get over into the IT system and eventually compromise the payment terminals and cause that big breach. Say Jude has uh, been shown to have vulnerabilities in their pacemakers, believe it or not. There is also a very famous hack of, of Jeep cars, and, and it's not uh, constrained to Jeep alone. Many cars have been vulnerable to these hacks. This one in particular, uh, an attacker, and this was a, a researcher, uh, came over the Sprint network, it was a little while ago, uh, and literally took over control of a car while a test driver was actually driving it. Um, and then most recently was a colonial pipeline attack. And, and whereas it wasn't actually an OT internet of things attack specifically, because it's such a sensitive pipeline and serves millions of barrels of, uh, of oil every single day and is incredibly important to the Eastern seaboard uh, heating and other operations as well. Uh, when they were attacked by ransomware, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through this, uh, they, they made the prudent decision to shut everything off because they knew that their operation technology couldn't face the further attack to go from IT to OT. And that's one of the big themes that continues to persist within the Internet of Things is this intersection between Internet information technology and operational technology. Now, the common theme across all of these things, all of these attacks is bad or missing authentication and secure communications. And that's what public key infrastructure gives you. So things aren't getting any better. In fact, things are getting worse and they're gonna continue uh, to get worse, I think, before they get better. This is uh, the most recent report from uh, Verizon's data breach report. And the, the main takeaway from this, I think, is that over in the top left, you see that primarily the motivation is organized crime. And if you look at the graph over on the right, that organized crime is increasing still at quite a dramatic clip. And what that really means is that there's a profit motivation for attackers to do these types of, of attacks. And so they're only gonna increase until we build up the defenses in such a way that it's too expensive or too difficult for them to achieve their aims. This is a, an interesting graph and, and a rather chilling graph if you really think about it. These are about a dozen or so different botnets. And recall, I, I mentioned the Mirai botnet before in the context of man in the middle attacks. Well, with the Mirai botnet and these others, um, there's been hundreds of thousands of compromised end devices. And in fact, the, the big takeaway here is that they've gone from a prevalence, according to Fortinet, of about 35% in January 21 to 51% in, in the six months since. Uh, and so again, these things are growing and, and it's a real problem. Yeah, so uh, speaking of that, and now that we have set up a background uh, as to how dangerous uh, the world could be out there for IoT devices that are not protected, you know, there's a big question that, that we have, you know, why do we need uh, IoT cybersecurity standards? Why is this important? And how uh, maybe our solution here at InterTrust can help alleviate uh, and, and support these standards? Thanks, Heb. That's a great lead in to where we're going next, because the, the malware and the attacks I described before 
really pale in comparison to the new generation of attacks. Uh, Black Energy is a very sophisticated, sophisticated exploit kit that's been deployed by the Russians to attack Ukrainian infrastructure. It's, it's very sophisticated and it's been very effective, unfortunately. Now, Petya is, an, is a malware, it's actually wipeware. Uh, the White House estimated it costs more than uh, $10 billion of damage around the world. It took Maersk, the biggest shipping container, shipping company in the world, completely offline. They had to replace thousands and thousands of machines because literally this not Petya pretended to be Petya, which was a ransomware malware, uh, it would even come up with a message saying, send Bitcoin to such and such an address, but that address never existed. All it did was literally wipe out the whole boot record, uh, start up all of, the, all of the hard drive and basically destroy machines. Um, again, a problem of lack of authentication and giving the software the, the ability and the rights to do that to machines. And from the Colonial Pipeline example, there's a little bit more to that that makes it even more worrisome. And it's the evolution of the business part of cyber criminals. And what that is, is ransomware as a service. So in fact, the actual technology that, that was used to exploit and attack and de deliver payloads and take over the Colonial Pipeline information technology systems uh, was deployed by one group, but the whole business arrangements and the ransom payment was handled by another group that was basically using the first group as, uh, as, as a service, ransomware as a service. And so this will allow cybercrime to scale even more. So what do you do about it? And this is uh, getting a little bit more into the solution part of, of how we protect our devices. How do we protect our uh, critical infrastructure? And first of all, it comes, uh, comes into public key infrastructure, uh, public key infrastructure and the way you deploy it and the things you need to look at when you're deploying your public key infrastructure. First of all is the, the scope. The threat models you're considering, the use cases of, of the devices, the types of devices you have, that will dictate uh, specifics as to the types of keys, key links, protocols, and things of that nature. You need to have a really good understanding of the risk so that you could create the appropriate countermeasures to counter that risk. So the probability of, of an, an attack happening. The impact, what happens if that device or collection of devices gets attacked and compromised? And then what is the inherent risk that comes from that? And then you could start building the portfolio of controlling mitigations to protect against that. This leads into the definition of how you're going to run your public key infrastructure. It's policies and procedures that really comes under a certificate practice statement. And that says, and I'll get more into the details of, of how, uh, how PKIs are, are managed and operated, but it gets into all the details about how you protect keys and keep some keys offline, some online, how you access them. Things like building the root CA, the, the root signing ceremony to create the initial root key and then put it into a high security module, disconnected from the internet, in a secure room, air gap from the rest of the world. Uh, the needs for high assurance because another type of denial of service attack is, it, is if you don't have sufficient uh, uh, availability of your systems. Uh, and so having high assurance, also having uh, recorded systems, having a protected location, and really designing the full chain of custody for your full system, as well as how it'll interoperate with other trusted systems as well. And then you need to build and configure all that infrastructure. There's going to be management systems, infrastructure systems. And of course, since this is so vital and underpinning the trust of your system, you need business continuity and, of course, disaster recovery. And security is a process, right? You need to continually review. You need to re continually test. You need to continually audit. You need to be continually vigilant. And so, you know, to answer Heb's question about uh, you know, why we need IoT security standards. I think that that question's been answered 
uh, to a large degree in this presentation, but also within the security community at, at large. And what that has resulted in is the IoT device cybersecurity capability core baseline. Uh, a bit of a mouthful from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. They're the ones that have brought us the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, a really effective way of analyzing and understanding risk. And they, in this document, define uh, six core capabilities for the baseline of devices. Number one is device ident identification. And it's not just about you know, having a unique ID for each device. Each device has to be cryptographically, immutably, meaning unchangeably identified within the network, both so that it can participate in a trusted way with the other parts of the system, and also to ensure that spoof devices can't come on and, and masquerade and become part of the system as well. It's a common technique of hackers. So it needs to be identified both logically and physically. Now, device configuration is another element, and it's one of the reasons why the Mirai botnet has been so successful, because a lot of default configurations within the IoT uh, are, are very, very weak, you know, weak protocols or, or weak requirements for passwords. And, you know, a lot of devices shouldn't have passwords anyway. So to have certificate-based authentication, then, then, then password-based. Data protection, of course, is, is essential. And data protection has kind of an old connotation and a newer connotation. The old connotation, it really has to do with the fact that this IoT data can be very, very sensitive. It, it can give you, uh, give an attacker uh, a really deep insight into how a manufacturing plant operates or a smart grid operates so that they can then further attack it. But the newer version of that is that data coming from these IoT devices is increasingly being used to improve operations using machine learning and AI capabilities. That's fantastic. And that has led to so much really rich, really beneficial automation. But what happens if that data gets changed? What if that data becomes poisoned and spiked in such a way that the machine learning models no longer operate the way we want them to and start working the way attackers and adversaries wanted to. So data protection end to end from the edge to the cloud and back again, persistently at rest and in transit is more important than ever before. Logical access to, to interfaces, being able to access the device and install software and things of that nature. It runs into the next one as well as software updates. All software has to be signed. And what signing does, another key capability of PKI, is it ensures the authenticity of the software, where it came from, and its integrity, meaning that it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed as it's been downloaded to update the, the device. And also, when the device is rebooted, when it goes through the power on self-test, it goes through and cryptographically validates that not a single bit of that software has been changed by a malicious actor. If anything has changed, the whole startup process stops and an, an alert is issued. And more generally, and this is a, a general thing for all of our systems, IT and OT, is to, to really level up our, our cybersecurity state of awareness. So now the question is, do you do this yourself or do you go to manage PKI? And the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about the two sides of managed PKI, the management part of it, and the infrastructure part of it. So let's jump in. So the management part of the PKI really involves how you operate this key infrastructure. One of the key elements is a registration authority. So the first thing is to know what devices need to be onboarded and brought into your, in, into your trusted universe. And so you need a vetting process to bring those in. It'll vary by vertical, it'll vary by application. And the thing that is in common with all of these is that there is a means by which we basically take the real world and, 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 and use keys to represent them into the cyber world. And there's, there's a process around that. Speaking of process, you can't trust a process unless you trust the people. So you need to have uh, really deep 
background checks. You need to be able to trust the people you have, have bonded people. The, the, the operations that, that they do are critical to the trust of, of whatever system is being protected with PKI. Included in that are custody protocols. So some data is so sensitive that you can't trust it to just one person alone uh, operating them. And that includes routes, that includes delegated routes. And so you need a process by which uh, certain operations require two people, and in some cases, even three people. And not just people, but people that are strongly identified and authenticated and we use, we use smart cards, we use biometrics to ensure that the number of people, the quorum that is needed is always present anytime you're going to do a sensitive operation on these sensitive key materials. One of the big tricks to all this, one of the difficult things to deploying PKI is securely embedding the key material into the IoT device. And what's tricky about that is that, first of all, embedded development is, is non-trivial. You need real, real specific uh, skill sets for that. Uh, a second challenge is that chipsets are so different. There are so many different types of chipsets, and they all have different security architectures. That's changing a little bit now. PSA certified uh, in a, an initiative from, from ARM is helping to consolidate that and make that look more common, but there's still a lot of fragmentation. So having the ability to do embedded crypto development is critical. Um, part of all of this, of course, is the significant upfront CapEx uh, for the hardware, the software, the systems, the web trust uh, certification. Um, Web Trust certification ensures that what you write in your certificate practice statement, how you're going to do all these things that I've been talking about, are actually done. Auditors come in every year and they go line by line and ensure all these things are done. So if you're looking at an outsourced PKI solution, you need to ensure that it's Web Trust certified so you can trust it. There's a number of other things, you know, auto renewal of short lived certificates that's become more and more important in recent years. And also to have a look at what's happened, to have detailed comprehensive analytics for detection and monitoring. So you can stop a problem early before it becomes a big problem. So the infrastructure part of, of PKI is important too. And that's what I was alluding to a little bit in the previous slide. Uh, you need to have 24 by 7 by 367, 365 operations because attackers don't sleep. And you need that availability so that your devices continue to operate. And so part of that is to ensure that you have multi-region disaster recovery for business continuity because you always have to anticipate when this is mission critical that something could happen, an earthquake or tornado, et cetera. You need to have regional diversity to protect yourself against that. To get into the system, you need to have modern means by which you can uh, securely identify people. And we use badges with secure cards, uh, biometric authentication. The, the sensitive operations need to be run in an air-gapped and tempest-shielded secure room. And of course, ventilating and air, air conditioning, all those you know, regular data operations are really critical as well. Another kind of added benefit of PKI, I've talked a lot about kind of the heavy lift to actually deploy it. And that was really around identity certificates, a basic profile version, things like that. But we've realized that you can innovate even within the certificate standard itself. And a merger of both the XML of an X509 v3 certificate that allows extensions with security assertion markup language, SAML, uh, allows you to do a lot more creative things while maintaining good security. And rich personality really offers more capability securely at the edge. So you can provide additional device and configuration context, who should be connecting to whom, reflect business rules and authorizations, and, and really allow automation at the edge while not worrying too much about the extent of that automation. So if you compare do-it-yourself to manage PKI, here's basically the way it runs down. The, the list of things you need to do 
dedicated air gap secure room that's going to be a capex and or ongoing opex depending how how you deploy that the whole badge and biometric authentication capex opex too now that i think of it uh, multiple region disaster recovery and secure business continuity capex and opex tightly controlled hvac capex and or opex all these things Bond embedded staff, multiple security protocols, the SDKs for embedded developers for chipset targets, all the detail monitoring and, and detect analytics, the actual high security modules uh, that you need to protect the keys when they're offline, uh, the trusted time server, auto renewal of short lived certificates. It's, it really adds up to a whole bunch of capital expenditures and operational expenditures, whereas instead, you could go to a provider, an expert in offering managed PKI services. And basically the cost of all of this is included in the cost of each certificate. So it really scales with your business even better than you know, platform as a service models or software as a service models. This is a, actually a, a per device model. And of course, with volume, the, the economies of scale become better and better. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this off with just a, a little bit of a uh, description of what we do at, at Intertrust. Uh, we've been running Intertrust PKI for 12 years now. We've issued well over 20 billion keys uh, to 2 billion devices. Uh, we, we issued tens of millions of keys every single month. We've never had a problem in, in our 12 years of operation, never had any kind of security breach or, or concern. We have, in that time, really developed a deep bench of capabilities. Flexible provisioning, whether on the factory floor or as is more common today with IoT devices being deployed at scale, provisioning in the, in, provisioning in the field. Uh, also, we're certified secure, of course. We're Web Trust certified, which is the gold standard for certificate authorities of PKIs. As I mentioned, rich identities we support. We also support uh, legacy devices, including app shielding and secure key box, because there's some old, uh, you know, insecure legacy devices that don't have sufficient security. And so we can make up for that. There's techniques. And XPN is uh, something we announced last week, explicit private networking. That's not the subject of today, but that adds another layer of security beyond just the device to the data. Um, ask us questions, we're, we'd, we'd be happy to, to tell you all about it. The bottom line shows some of the uh, devices that we've uh, integrated with, or you know, all the, some of the biggest chipset providers in the world. And with that, I think uh, once again, I'll, I'll thank you all for, for attending, for giving uh, us a chance to talk and share about PKI. It's, it's our favorite subject. And uh, I'll hand it back to you, Heb. Oh, uh, thanks, Jolene. This has been very informational, and we actually have a couple of questions. So uh, I want to see if uh, we can at least uh, uh, answer a couple of them. So uh, first one came in. It said, "What is the best practice for doing PKI auditing, and how often and how deep should we do it?" That's oh, that's a great question. So PKI, there's different ways to look at it, right? There's um, the the Web Trust certification is an annual audit. And, and that's really your, your bare minimum. Web Trust tends to be a little bit more for outsourced PKIs like, like ourselves. If you do it internally, you, know, you don't have any requirement for it, but you better be sure that you've written a very good certificate practice statement with all those operational things I was talking about, all those facilities, and that you hold yourself to that. And I think that's one of the great benefits of going to an outsourced PKI because they, we are held to that every year. Uh, our auditors come in and, and are very thorough in identifying all, all of these things. You need to do a little bit more than that. And we go above and beyond just the minimum requirements of, of web trust auditing. And we have, we have daily, weekly, monthly audits of all the records that, that are produced, uh, all of the ingress and egress to the secure room, I had I could go on and on, but it's it's a really long list, and I'm probably bore everyone to death. But it's uh, really critical that you really verify what it is you've been doing. Well, got it. That's that's really helpful as well. The last question that I think uh, I'm really looking forward to the answer to this one 
Are physical security methods less important as, I, as IT infrastructure moves to the cloud? Could you repeat that last bit again, please? Have sure. Are physical security methods mm. less important as IT infrastructure moves to the cloud? Uh, that's that's a great question. Yeah. What 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 really moving to the cloud has done is there's a few interesting factors to that. Uh, in, in one extent, it's it's expanded our our attack surface, right? Because not only are we running operations, you know, on the ground without cloud connectivity. Now, now we have another set of uh, systems and servers in, in the cloud itself. Um, it offers tremendous uh, benefits, especially in the elasticity for the incredibly high volume of PKI devices. And it marries really well to the modern chipsets that are deployed in the field. You have to be really careful and specific about it. And when you get to uh, hardware security uh, measures, uh, physical security measures, you need to have a root of trust somewhere, right? And so to have, to have roots in the cloud, I wouldn't feel very comfortable about that. Although of course, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud have done tremendous, a tremendous job of securing those infrastructures. Still, it's not as secure as an air-gapped room, tempest-shielded room, uh, your root key in a high security module completely connect, disconnected from the internet. Um, you need that as your root of trust. And then, and then you can have delegate keys in the cloud and the delegate keys can take advantage of all the elasticity and scaling. And if there is ever a concern, you have means by which you can revoke and remediate that aren't overly, aren't overly painful. You won't have your root of trust uh, compromised. I was muted, sorry. Yeah, so thank you for that answer. That's, uh, uh, that's really interesting. I've, I've, I've learned a lot uh, by listening to all this information today. Um, I would like to say to the partic participants that this is not the end of this uh, webinar. Their conversation can continue uh, via email. If you'd like to contact us and have more uh, detail and information, we'll be happy to respond back. So, can I, yeah. I see one more question coming in from oh, did. PR. G. Radanak, and I'd love to answer it. Uh, PKI is adapted for specific devices. For some constrained ones, symmetric keys remain the main solution. Do you offer also keys as a service for some customers? And the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. I really focused on the, the PKI elements to this and, and certificates because that's kind of the majority of the business, but there are quite a number. There's about a dozen or so different cryptographic things that we create, nonces, uh, literally cryptographic blobs, um, symmetric keys of all different types. There's also different types of public keys. And, and we really support all the different standards because we really understand there's a, uh, you need to have this, you can have, you have digital signing and other types of mechanisms such as HMAX uh, with symmetric keys. And they're the right solution. It's never the right solution to leave your device unprotected. And there's also like management, EDR, respond and detect capabilities you'd want for those uh, symmetric key devices because distribution, I'm sorry, I can really get into the weeds in this. Um, the answer is, uh, yeah, we absolutely do. And they're important. Perfect, thanks for answering that, that last question. Uh, is there any more questions from the audience? Please uh, feel free to uh, uh, ask them now. If not, as I mentioned, the conversation can continue uh, via email or other means. We uh, Please feel, feel free to reach out to them. Uh, we'll be happy to connect with you. Uh, if no further questions, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, I would like to also remind you this is not uh, also uh, the, a one-time one time off. We, we do this regularly. We have a number of uh, webinars discussing topics like this. So feel free to check, uh, check us out, check our website, check our LinkedIn, uh, where you'll have information uh, about our upcoming events. Um, so uh, once again, thanks very much. Uh, I wish you a good rest of your day. And uh, if no more further questions, I see that there's nothing else coming in. Um, we can uh, end this, this webinar and we look forward to, for you uh, to attend the next one. So uh, take care. Thanks very much.